Um, welcome to this very special book talk that we have this afternoon, co-sponsored by uh, the Black Law Students Association and the Lillian Goldman Law Library. My name is Diane Lake, and I am the president of BALSA. Uh, for this afternoon's book talk, we have Professor Stephen L. Carter, class of 79, and Leah Carter, class of 2012, discussing their new book, Invisible, the Forgotten Story of the Black Woman Lawyer Who Took Down America's Most Powerful Mobster. Stephen L. Carter is the William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Law at Yale Law School, where he has been a member of the faculty since 1982. Among his most recent courses are Contracts, Evidence, Law and Religion, The Ethics of War, Slavery and the Law, and Libertarian Legal Theory. Uh, Professor Carter is the author of numerous books and novels and has also been the columnist on The Daily Beast, Bloomberg, among others. Professor Carter is a graduate of Stanford University and Yale Law School. He served as a law clerk for Justice Thurgood Marshall at the United States Supreme Court and earlier for Judge Spotswood Robinson on the United States Courts of Appeal for the District of Columbia Circuit. Leah Eric Carter is a researcher and former lawyer. She holds a JD from Yale Law School where she was an editor on the Journal of Law and Feminism, a research assistant for Professor Claire Priest and a Coker Fellow for Professor James Foreman's small group. Leah spent four years as a litigator at Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton and Garrison LLP and then left to work on Invisible. Please give a round of applause for Leah and Stephen Carter. Uh, well, thank you for that very kind introduction. It's a great pleasure for both of us uh, to be here. I want to thank both the uh, Black Law Student Association uh, and the Lillian Goldman Law Library for arranging uh, this talk. We'll, we're going to try to be brief to allow as much time as possible for questions. Um, I should explain the, the reason we're both here is that although my name uh, appears on the cover that uh, Leah, my daughter, was the indispensable, indeed, was the principal researcher uh, on the project, the one who went around visiting distant archives and cataloging letters, um, tracking down people to interview and, and, and so on. And there are many parts of the story, although she denies this, that I think she knows better than I do, um, especially some parts of history that didn't make it into the book that I'm sure will make it into the uh, our conversation. We're going to try, the two of us, not to talk for too long um, because we would like to hear what you have to say and answer questions um, uh, and, and so on. Um, but before we begin, or, or the two, I should say to begin, uh, I, I want to set the scene uh, for the part of the book that's captured in the subtitle, The Black Woman Who Took Down America's Most Powerful Mobster. Um, you have to uh, envision New York in the early 1930s, New York City, which was largely run uh, by the mob, although the mob at that time really encompassed several different uh, ethnic gangs, uh, white and black. Uh, there were black gangs running large chunks of Harlem, which was by far the most lucrative mob property because it was the place where the numbers game was most popular and the numbers game was an enormous source of profit uh, to the mob. When I say the city was largely run by the mob, that included the city government, which was largely paralyzed. Reformers in the newspapers and the civic clubs were constantly calling for investigations of organized crime and so on, uh, and the city basically did nothing, not least because the, uh, the district attorney at the time, a man named William Dodge, who was basically uh, an, an extension of Tammany Hall was in the pocket of the mob, literally took money, and therefore never investigated any serious mob figures. Then in early 1935, uh, a grand jury to which Dodd's office was representing evidence of very petty criminality against a couple of very minor mob figures, uh, the grand jury kicked the assistant DA out of the room and sent a note to the supervising judge saying that they would not work with Dodge's office anymore and they wanted to investigate real organized crime and what could be done about this. Um, as a result of this, uh, the newspapers began to write about New York's runaway grand jury. Uh, and what finally happened was the governor of New York, it was Governor Lehman at the time, uh, 
in what today would be considered entirely improper, met with the foreman of the grand jury who turned over the grand jury's minutes. And as a result of that meeting, uh, the governor gave an ultimatum uh, to the district attorney to appoint a special prosecutor to investigate or have his own office investigated by the, uh, by the uh, New York attorney general. So after some hemming and hawing and a lot of false efforts at appointment, finally uh, Dodge appointed a man named uh, Thomas Dewey, who later would, of course, be governor and would also uh, be a twice unsuccessful presidential candidate, actually thrice unsuccessful if you count the time that he ran for the nomination and didn't win. And Dewey uh, exacted a lot of promises before he would agree to serve, among them that he have his own budget and his own offices and so on, and be able to select his own staff. And in selecting his staff, he wanted no one who had anything to do with any prosecutor's office in New York. Um, he ended up selecting 20 lawyers. They were known in the newspapers and later in the title of Dewey's own autobiography as 20 Against the Underworld. That's what they were called, the 20 Against the Underworld. 20 lawyers he selected, 19 white males and one black woman. This book is the story of the one black woman uh, that he selected. Uh, and in a moment, you'll hear a little bit more about her life. Um, so he selected these 20 individuals, and the newspapers mainly talked about the black woman that he selected, whose name was Eunice. They largely talked uh, uh, about Eunice. She had her picture in the New York Times and in papers as far away as California, whereas the rest of the staff was largely anonymous uh, to the public. The news story was basically Dewey selects Negro, was basically the the headline, or Dewey selects colored lawyer. These are the headlines uh, that you saw uh, at the time. Um, he moved into his office. He had this guarded office, uh, hard to get into, 20 lawyers, no two of them sharing even so much as an ante room, so no one who was there to talk to a lawyer could ever see anyone else who was there talking uh, to a lawyer. And he divided up the tasks, and 19 of the lawyers, that is the 19 white males, were set to investigating things like numbers running and loan sharking and drug running and murder and all the various things that tended to upset the civic reformers uh, because Dewey said he would never uh, try to investigate organized crime figures uh, on something like tax evasion, for example. Remember the way that they got, um, excuse me, <coughs> the way that they got Al Capone. Uh, he only wanted to do serious crimes. That was what 19 of them investigated. The 20th lawyer, the black woman lawyer, Eunice, was set to investigating prostitution. Um, now, you have to understand at this time, there have been very few female prosecutors in the nation's history, and nearly all of them had been sent into what were those days in most jurisdictions called the women's courts. And they mainly prosecuted prostitution cases which was seen as, it's been referred to in some of the histories as the graveyard from which the careers of female prosecutors never returned. Well, she wasn't set to prosecute prosecution cases. She was set to listen to public complaints because when Dewey gave a speech on the radio inviting the public to come and talk about uh, prosecution, uh, about what bothered them, uh, what they wanted investigated, overwhelmingly they said prostitution. There were letters that came in that pe there were people who came in uninvited off the street and overwhelmingly they wanted to talk to them about prostitution in their neighborhood. This is a crime that Dewey had no intention of prosecuting. But he assign had to assign a lawyer to listen to those complaints so people would believe they were being taken seriously. And that lawyer was Eunice, the one black woman. So the white, 19 white men were all doing loan sharking and drug running and so on, and she was investigating prostitution. The irony was, without going into too much detail now, we can talk more about it in the Q&A, the irony was that those um, 19 white males never turned up a prosecutable crime against Lucky Luciano, who at the time was the head of the mob and the most powerful mobster uh, in the country, as well as, as some of you know, the one who created the modern... Uh, uh, the modern mafia. Many of the things that Luciano did are attributed to Don Corleone in the 
novel version of uh, of the Godfather and building the modern uh, the modern mafia, the five families, the commission, all that is stuff that um, uh, that Luciano uh, came up with. Uh, the only one who ever came with a prosecutable crime was Eunice. Uh, Eunice was able to prove, uh, at least to the satisfaction of those in the office, Luciano's connection to prostitution. At first, when she tried to make her argument, um, Dewey was skeptical. Uh, but eventually, when she kept turning up evidence and all of the other 19 white male lawyers who were looking for evidence of other crimes couldn't connect him to them because there were too many layers of insulation, uh, she was able to make the case uh, that the mob was involved in the prostitution business because the mob taxed prostitution, took money from it, and that sitting at the top of the sitting at the top of the mob of those who were taking money from it was uh, was lucky uh, Luciano. Uh, finally, uh, Luciano was indicted on those charges and on nothing else. He actually fled the jurisdiction, but he was arrested in um, uh, in Hot Springs, Arkansas, after he offered a fifty thousand dollar bribe to the Attorney General of Arkansas to let him go, but the bribe was uh, uh, was turned down. Apparently, as uh, the Attorney General supposedly said to him, under the circumstances, that he couldn't accept uh, uh, the money. <laughs> So he was brought back uh, to New York, and he was tried. And the, the key witnesses at the trial uh, were not his associates, but four women. Um, three of them, really, were the, were the key ones. Um, each of them was someone who'd worked in prostitution. One of them was a drug addict. They were women who testified basically to overhearing conversations between Eunice and, and I'm sorry, between Luciano and his associates. Uh, involving uh, prostitution. Now, the thing you have to understand is that when it came time to try the case, that Eunice had developed the theory, collected the evidence, interviewed the women, and drawn all the connections, including all the charts of how the business actually worked in New York. But when it came time to try the case, uh, Dewey chose as his co-counsels in the case three white men, not um, uh, not uh, Eunice. She did have an interesting involvement in the case, namely that she was charged with taking care of the women who were going to testify, uh, finding them secure places to stay with police guards and so on uh, and so on. I'm not going to go into detail about the trial now. We can talk about it in the Q&A uh, if you want to. But Luciano was convicted, and it was the only crime which he was ever convicted, was the crime in which Eunice had come up with legal theory and had developed all the evidence, interviewed all the women, and basically uh, provided the case to Dewey, if not on a silver platter, uh, certainly in lots and lots of, of folders. Um, and we, we have more to say about Eunice and more to say about her life after the trial. In a moment, Leah is going to talk about her life before the trial. That is, who was this woman? The one that I didn't mention that some of you know already that I should have mentioned, perhaps, is that Eunice was uh, Leah's great-grandmother and my grandmother. So Leah is going to talk to you about where this woman came from, the, what forces that produced her, and then we'll talk a little bit about after the trial and so on. And then we'll take your questions. So I, first, I just want to say how cool it is to be back here. And it's kind of surreal to be sitting on the side of 127. <laughs> um, but yeah, so Eunice was my great grandmother. And before I started working on the book, I knew very little about her. I knew that she had been a prosecutor, uh, that she had been somehow involved with bringing down Lucky Luciano. And I knew that she was kind of a stern and intimidating grandmother. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> apparently she was. Uh, but uh, she actually, one of the things we learned in researching this is she kind of intimidated everyone, not just her grandkids. Um, but she actually came from a really fascinating family. Uh, so her family, sort of as we conceptualize it, starts with her paternal grandfather, uh, who's a man named Stanton Hunton. He was enslaved in Virginia, and he actually escaped enslavement three times although he was always ultimately caught, but he eventually bought his freedom um, with money that he earned probably working as a carpenter. 
And he eventually moved to Canada. He moved to Chatham, Ontario, and he became very successful there. He built a successful business, and he married a woman named Marianne Conyer from Cincinnati, and they had nine children, uh, the seventh of whom was Eunice's father, William Hunton. So what we know about William Hunton's upbringing is that it was... Apparently, he had a happy family life, but it was very strict. Um, Stanton used to make his children, at least his male children, I would imagine the girls too, do a lot of chores. And when they ran out of chores, he would just make them move piles of bricks from one side of the yard to the other, you know, so they would be industrious and disciplined and not lazy. Um, And William grew up to be the kind of young man you would assume he would be based on that upbringing. Um, He was serious and he, he took his duty what he believed to be his duty very seriously. And what he believed to be his duty in life was he worked for the YMCA and he traveled all around the country and all around the world, um, basically opening and supporting what were at the time called colored branches of the YMCA because he really believed in the work of the YMCA, which at the time, um, the Y then was very different from the Y now. And it was about you know creating an environment for sort of Christian education of young men. And he, he really believed in this mission. He was constantly, he loved his family, but he was constantly away from his family, working on this, visiting several cities a week, and ultimately I think worked himself to death. Um, he just, he died relatively young of tuberculosis and he was, Yeah, he just worked and worked no matter how sick he got. And um, he was actually, he was a very interesting, inspiring person. I read a lot of his letters, um, at which are at Howard University. And I remember when I got to the end of his letters and read the last letter that he wrote to his best friend, Jesse Moreland, before he died, I started crying in the reading room at Howard University because it was so, it was so moving to have gotten to know this man who was my great great grandfather who I had never even heard of really before I started working on this book and I by the end I really felt like I got to know him frankly more than anyone else in the research I think including Eunice um so that was Eunice's father and then her mother was an amazing woman uh named Adelina uh, Adelina Lawton actually Adelina Hunton everyone called her Addie she was born around 1866, we think, in Virginia. We don't know exactly when she was born because she lied about her age all the time throughout her life. Um, But she was a club woman and an activist, and she traveled all around the country um, lecturing, and she did a lot of work for the NAACP where she would basically go into areas that were just terrorized by the Ku Klux Klan to remind the NAACP chapters there that the national organization had not forgotten them and basically keep their spirits up. And she did this alone. She was a black woman traveling alone through the South into these areas, you know, that were basically controlled by the Klan. And she also spent a lot of time uh, lecturing, giving lectures about various issues, including and especially the importance of black motherhood and how the most important job for a black woman uh, was to take care of her children. Obviously, while she was traveling around doing this, other people were taking care of her children. But... Um, which I'm not saying to be critical, obviously, uh, but it was just a fun fact about her. Um, but so these were, uh, these were Eunice's parents. Eunice also had a younger brother. Uh, his name was Alpheus. His name was William Alpheus after his father. Um, everyone calls him Alpheus. He grew up to be also a really interesting figure in his own right. He went to, uh, Howard and then Harvard and NYU. He got a PhD in Victorian literature, um, became a professor of Victorian literature at Howard, although he was also, the thing he's most known for um, is that he was a communist and not someone who was just called, he was a real communist. Like he, you know, wrote birthday cards to Stalin. And um, he, in uh, 1951, would actually go to jail um, for refusing to name names during the McCarthy era, and eventually after that, just leave the country entirely. Uh, and I guess we haven't really gotten into Eunice's later career, but suffice it to say, her career didn't end up in life going the way that she hoped it would, and she always blamed Alpheus for that. Um, she always thought that that was because her brother was a communist, and I'm sure that that was part of it. Um, 
So that was Eunice's family. Oh, one other thing I want to share about her childhood is, or two things. So uh, Eunice was born in Atlanta in 1899. Uh, her family settled down in Atlanta and they lived there until 1907 uh, when there was a race riot in Atlanta. Um, the white citizens, some of the white citizens, uh, rose up and started attacking black businesses and black homes and assaulting black people and burning their businesses down. And after this, a lot of black citizens left, including Eunice's family. Um, and the next year, who was, was the next year? Um, Eunice's family, they moved to Brooklyn after this and they went to vacation on the Jersey Shore. And there's a family story that while she was on vacation, she met a young boy on the beach and they started playing. And she told him that when she grew up, she wanted to be a lawyer. And the reason she wanted to be a lawyer was because she wanted to make sure that the bad guys went away. And that's what she grew up to do. So um, I'm just going to say a few more words about Eunice's uh, later career, and then Leah's going to say some closing words. Then we'll take um, questions and comments that you have. But first, a comment about Eunice's earlier career. Um, Eunice... Um, people always ask, she went to Smith College and she went to Fordham Law School. Now, it's quite striking. Um, when she went to law school in the early 1930s, um, most of the, what were in those days described as the big law schools, and maybe are described that way that today as well, um, did not admit women. Um, and a lot of them, even if they didn't have formal restrictions, had informal restrictions on racial minorities generally. So if you look at the biographies of women of color who went to law school in that era, um, really until the, with, with a couple of minor exceptions, like of course uh, Jane Boleyn, uh, they overwhelmingly went to uh, Catholic law schools. Uh, the Catholic law schools not only uh, admitted women and people of color early on, but they had a kind of mission uh, to educate people who couldn't go to the other law schools. And a lot of the big law schools, including, I have to say, Yale, um, got, began trying to put barriers in the way of graduates of those law schools becoming members of the bar. So, for example, in the 1920s, shortly before Eunice uh, arrived to begin law school, uh, Yale was one of several schools uh, that tried to uh, get the bar to adopt, the New York bar, for example, to adopt a rule that graduates of night schools, no matter how many hours of class they had, couldn't go to become members of the bar if they attended school at night unless they did all these various other things, which you can see not only affected, had effects uh, that were gendered and racial effects, but it also had class effects because who are the people who could afford to not work while they were, uh, uh, were in school? Uh, so I want to tell you that for you. I, I, I want to go back to what Leah said afterwards. So after, after the prosecution, the successful prosecution of Lucky Luciano, Dewey became very famous and was easily, he had been special prosecutors, easily elected of New York County District Attorney, and he appointed Eunice um, after about a year. He, he brought her over with him, and after about a year, he appointed her head of special sessions, which at the time was the biggest bureau in the office. That was the name of the misdemeanor bureau, which had something like half the office's cases uh, were there. Now, Dewey subsequently ran for governor, and he also ran three times for president. And when he ran for president, when he ran for governor, uh, he ran with what at the time was the strongest civil rights plank up to that date that any uh, major party had ever used. And when he ran, uh, he would always talk about his non-discriminatory hiring practice. He'd always point to, and the biggest bureau in my office is run by a black woman. He would said this routinely on the stump. Eunice campaigned for him very hard, uh, both for governor and in his presidential runs. Um, and Eunice, having worked so hard on behalf, always had the sense that there were things that were going to come to her, that um, she would appointed this or that commission. Her real, what she really, really wanted to do was to become a judge. Um, and the things she wanted didn't come. And there were a lot of explanations we might have of why they didn't come. And, but when Eunice thought about it, 
what had gone wrong in her career. And she finally she left the prosecutor's office in 1945 after she'd been there almost uh, 10 years and went on to other things involving international work in the United Nations that we can get into some more if you want to. Um, but always with the sense that this was her second best life. She never was a judge and never got to do some of the other things she'd hoped to do. At one point, she thought of running for Congress. So we might look back and say, oh, these rewards didn't come because she was black or because she was female or because of the combination of the two. But as Leah said a moment ago, Eunice always took the view that these things she didn't get to do were because of her brother. And, and uh, Leah mentioned that, that her brother was a real communist, which he was. He was a high-ranking member of the Communist Party. His FBI file is 700 pages long. That's just the unredacted parts of it. That is, to give you a sense of it, that is something like three times as long as Martin Luther King's FBI file, to give you one uh, uh, example. Uh, he did favors for Soviet intelligence, it appears, from a couple of entries in the file. One of them seems unlikely. The other one seems entirely um, uh, likely. He was entirely dedicated um, to communism and uh, and for the rest of his life, until he left the country in the fifth, late 50s, um, he was on, some of you may know, if you know that history, you know that during the McCarthy era, um, there were uh, these custodial detention lists that were maintained by various federal security agencies on recommendation of the FBI. And they were people who were supposed to be rounded up in the event of national emergency and imprisoned without charges. And his name was on that those lists. The, the earliest memo from Hoover, um, uh, so adding his name to the list is from the early 1940s, uh, and he was on the list till he left to the country. I don't know about, I, I can't remember if he was on the list after that. I'm embarrassed to, uh, to say. Um, so Eunice attributed the things that she didn't get uh, to her brother. Uh, her brother uh, suffered greatly on the part, kind of what he believed. One of the reasons, some of you know, who are here know that I'm a, a firm defender of free speech, especially in the academy, and Alpheus, what happened to Alpheus is a part of that because he was denied all sorts of positions on things he should have had simply because of what he believed and what he argued for. And I just think I, I have very strongly view that that's absolutely wrong, but it was the era in which he lived and people suffered for uh, basically uh, their, uh, uh, their opinions. Um, as Leah told you, he went to prison in 1951 for refusing to name names. Um, I don't know if you've taken a First Amendment course in this and, and discussed the Dennis case. The Dennis case, as some of you know, uh, involved the trial of 11 leaders of the Communist Party, basically for being leaders of the Communist Party. Uh, and of course, they were uh, convicted. And uh, no one would pay their bail. And so there was a bail fund uh, to pay for to pay for them to be out on bail pending appeal. And, and the bail fund was uh, created by something called the Civil Rights Congress, which was a big left organization at the time. And there were three trustees of the bail fund. And one was the writer Dashiell Hammett. And one was um, Frederick Vanderbilt Field, who was the heir to both the Vanderbilt and the Field fortunes, but got disinherited um, because of his communist activities. And one was Alpheus Hunt. He was the third one. And when the leaders of the Communist Party, four of the 11 leaders of the Communist Party were convicted, skipped bail. And when they were skipped bail, when they skipped bail, uh, they were called before, the, the trustees were called before a federal judge and asked to name the people who uh, had given to the bail fund. Um, on the theory, it's not a ridiculous theory, that those people might know where these people were hiding. But but uh, they stood up for their principles. They believed deeply in the principle of anonymity in contributions. I, yes, I believe in that one too. And they um, they refused to answer. And so the U.S. attorney, the Sydney U.S. attorney who was there, who was actually Roy Cohn, who some of you may have heard of in other connections, uh, asked the judge to send them to prison, which the judge happily did. And they was, so they went to prison for contempt of court for refusing to give the information about who contributed to the bail of the Communist Party leaders. When Alpheus finally got out of prison, um, he basically had there was, he had no work. There's no place he could work. He worked in a factory for a little while, but he finally left the country uh, in 1957 and uh, went to Africa. Um, and he um, he never came back. He, he never came back. He first went, went first to Ghana to uh, take over the Encyclopedia Africana from Du Bois, who was ailing by then. Uh, and then after the coup, he went to uh, Zambia, where he lived the rest of his life. 
um, and they never returned to the United States. Well, when he got out of prison in 1951, the story my father always told me was that he and his sister Eunice never spoke again. We don't know if this is literally true. We know they corresponded toward the end of their lives, but Eunice never wavered in her absolute belief that the thing that she didn't get, she didn't get because because her brother was a big communist. And again, not an accused communist, not an alleged communist, the real died in the wool, as Leah said, send birthday cards to Comrade Stalin. He would actually circulate these letters. Everybody please sign this so we can congratulate Comrade Stalin on his birthday. Um, and there has to be some truth to that. Of course there is truth. It has to be true that race got in the way. It has to be that gender got in the way. But there were black people, including black women, who were able to accomplish various things and even get some of the things she wanted once she thought she was going to be appointed to Dewey's cabinet in New York, and he put another black woman instead. Uh, Dewey and Hoover were friends. Um, as some of you know, um, well, they worked together, anyway, I don't know if they're friends or not, but they, were, they worked closely together on a variety of things. And it's hard to imagine that Hoover didn't say to Dewey on some occasion, you know, I know you think Eunice is great, but with her brother and your political ambitions, you appoint this woman to something, you're going to run into, uh, uh, run into trouble. So I think it's fair to say that although toward the end of their lives, she and her brother corresponded, that she went to her grave believing that it was her brother's politics that he kept her from getting the things that she wanted. And she was absolutely furious um, about that. One last thing before I turn it back over to Leah, and then we'll take questions, which is Leah said that, um, that my grandmother was very intimidating. It's, it's true. She died when I was in 10th grade. Uh, but uh, my memories of her uh, largely uh, involved this stern, distant woman who was always correcting our grammar and correcting which fork we picked up in what uh, order, uh, and so on and so on. Was always mad at my mother. She felt for making us insufficiently polite in our uh, in our raising. Leah. Uh, so yeah, I just have a couple of closing thoughts. Um, I first just wanted to share what it incredible opportunity it's been to work on this book and thank you again for this thank you, you know, letting me do research for you it was so much fun it was really cool i mean it's a really interesting story even if this weren't my family and having the opportunity to get to know my family in this way has just been so amazing um i was actually going to share the story about crying in the howard archives now but obviously i shared it already um but yeah it's just been really amazing and i think it's really important. I think it's important to tell stories like this. Um, I think, uh, I don't know what all of your educations were like, but I know when I was growing up, the sort of black history that I got was a little bit thin. And there was certainly not a lot of, it, it, there was very much a sense that like nobody black ever did anything until Martin Luther King came along. And then he did something with marching and buses. And But like, I think, yeah, it's really important to tell these stories um, and to tell us, stories that remind us that, you know, black people were doing things and being movers and shakers for a long time. Um, it's certainly really important to me. And yeah, I just wanted to share that. I look forward to hearing your questions and anything else you guys have to share. Thank you.